Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of the book you see in front of you, Modifying the Aerodynamics of Your Road Car. What I want to do in today's video is look at one of the all-time classic aero cars, the Citroen DS. Here it is. It was first produced back in 1955, and its shape was extraordinarily adventurous for the time, and it still remains an incredibly eye-catching car. Now, what prompted me to do this video is I came across this ad from 1963. In fact, from October 1963. So this advertisement came out when I was one month old. And what got me interested was the headline, Citroen's aerodynamic styling pays off. And then this tagline, how Citroen breaks the long-standing performance economy barrier for sedans with speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour and yet 30 miles per gallon economy. And what the ad talks about is the fact that a lot of that performance economy compromise was achieved through aerodynamic optimization, low drag. And unusually, the ad actually talks about some specific aspects of the car's design that causes that low drag. And that's what I want to take a look at in today's video. So here's one of the diagrams from that advertisement, and it says Citroen's coefficient of air resistance, what we now call it CD, drag coefficient, is the lowest for any car in its class. Now note they don't actually give a figure. I'll come back to figures a bit later in the video. Contours are designed to make the air layers hug the body, reduce turbulence, the main cause of friction and wind noise. I don't know if I'd put friction there in that sort of context, but that's fine. But have a look at the shape of the car as shown in the advertisement. And there's two things I want you to look at. Firstly, you've got attached flow across the top, but look how it separates at the end of the roof. Now that actually creates quite a large area of wake. Wake is a low pressure area, so it's pulling back on the car. And today, when we look at that body shape, we'd say, gee, that's quite a big wake that you're dragging behind the car. But conversely, on the positive side, have a look underneath the car. Now, you can see it's a largely flat underfloor. I'll show you a photo under the car a little bit later in this video. And there's two other things to look at. One is the body shape underneath actually incorporates a diffuser. The floor rises towards the rear of the car, and that is excellent for both drag and reducing lift. But also, in this case, the front of the car is a bit higher as well. And we wouldn't do that today. We would keep the front of the car parallel to the ground because that rising shape at the front of the car is likely to create lift as well. So, big wake, but on the positive side of things, uh, attached flow under the car, and especially interesting is that rear diffuser. What about this? Now, this is where the car was very advanced for the time. Flat floors had been used on Tatras, flat floors had been used on Porsches, but when we talk about the ducting being used at the front, as far as I'm aware, that's probably unique for the period of this car. And Citroen rightly call it internal aerodynamics. That's a really good way of putting it. Citroen reduces friction in radiator cooling. The intake one, there's the radiator intake, uh, delivers air through a sealed duct system to the radiator. Again, that's really cutting edge stuff for the time and it's still pretty good today. The powered disc brakes are cooled by separate air intake and duct systems, number two. And here's what's really interesting. Small air scoops at number three, that's number three there and number three there, provide air for interior heating and ventilation. Now, if you look at the front of the car, you'll see that the threes, the ducts at number three, are actually in the stagnation zone, the zone of highest pressure at the front of the car. So they're the perfect place to put ducts to run a ventilation system for the cabin. Serendipitous? No, I don't think so. I think that was the result of actual pressure measurement either on models or on the full-size uh, mock-up bodies. Now, in the ad, it says top view shows clean Citroen lines. It's, a, it's an unusually uh, unexplanative uh, line for the particular ad. So I've, I've found this photo on the left. Now, <clears throat> it shows the clean Citroen lines perhaps a little bit better. Start off by looking under the car. As we've already said, it's an excellent underfloor, flat underfloor, and notice also that the muffler is recessed. The exhaust pipe is exposed as it still needs to be largely for cooling purposes. Uh, exhaust can glow red hot if you're driving at full load. Um, so they, they have not left that exposed, but they've recessed the muffler and you can see the rest of the floor is, is very good indeed. Now, what about those clean Citroen lines? 
Well, if you look at the one on the left, obviously looking down on the top of the car, you can see that there's excellent boat tailing, and that is across the rear of the car, in plan view, the sides of the car are closer together. The car tapers inwards towards the back. And in fact, you can see the rear wheels are closer together than the front wheels to allow for that body tapering. Now, we talked about the wake earlier, the height of the wake. Well, boat tailing in this way reduces the width of the wake. So it reduces the area of the base of the car that's exposed to the wake, the area that's exposed to that low pressure, and so the wake is, is effectively smaller than it would be if the sides of the car remained parallel. Now, boat tailing is very commonly done on cars and has been for 20, 25 years, but certainly way back in 1955, uh, as evidenced by the <coughs> narrower track at the back of the car, which was almost unheard of, it's very, very unusual for a car manufacturer to, to use boat tailing in those days. Now, what does all that add up to? Well, I did a quick look around the web and a lot of people are claiming a drag coefficient, a CD of 0.36, for the original Citroen DS. The Aerodynamics of Road Vehicle, one of the most authoritative books ever produced on automotive aerodynamics, states 0.38, and I would believe Hucho and Aerodynamics of Road Vehicles over almost any other source. Now, 0.38, these days we would look at that and say, that's terrible, that's disgusting. Uh, we, we've got uh, mainstream cars down in 0.24 and drag coefficients of that sort. So what probably caused such a high drag coefficient in, in today's terms? Uh, and when I say probably, it's, it's hard to do uh, any more than guess without actually having wind tunnel evidence. But I would say the size of the rear wake, the size of that wake, especially its height, is quite large. Uh, and you would expect that to be contributing a great deal of that drag. There may also be some trailing vortices coming off the back of the car. Um, the fact that um, you've got this curved surface over the top of the roof, as in most cars, of course, will be creating lift. Uh, you would have some of that offset with the high-speed airflow under the car with the smooth floor, but it would almost certainly still be a lift-creating body. In fact, it will be a lift-creating body, and lift-creating bodies uh, develop trailing vortices, and those vortices are a, a massive cause of drag. But that's looking at it rather negatively. What were its competitors' drag figures? Well, that's hard to tell, but probably 0 0.45, 0 0.48 in that sort of region. And so the DS was marvelously slippery in its contemporaneous terms. And if we go back to that ad, the fact that it could get that fuel consumption and have that sort of top speed certainly very much relates to the fact that it did have a very low drag coefficient for the time. So what do we make of that car? Well, I think it's an extraordinary car, and I haven't even touched on the other things I like, like the hydropneumatic suspension. Uh, an extraordinary car, extraordinarily brave, um, and then went on to be incredibly successful for, for three generations of that car and many decades subsequent to this very first one. Uh, so in terms of the technology of the car, in terms of the aerodynamics of the car, just an absolutely fantastic car. I, I would dearly love to own one, but I'd, I'd want it to be in good condition because I don't think it's that much of a do it yourself car, not with the complexity of the, of the hydraulics, but in terms of aerodynamics, a fantastic car. The book's called Modifying the Aerodynamics of Your Road Car. In chapter two of that book, I actually cover a whole bunch of cars which I think are interesting from a historic point of view in terms of the aerodynamics, and I look forward to you reading that book. Thank you.